Celebrating John Coltrane's 80th birthday, Concord Music Group has released Fearless Leader, a six-CD box set focusing exclusively on Train's prestige recordings. Jazz historian and Coltrane biographer Lewis Porter contributed liner notes to the Fearless Leader box set. Here, he talks about Train's prestige sessions. In the prestige years, you not only hear Coltrane playing magnificent saxophone, I mean, he's flying all over the place, and he's got plenty of ideas. You hear him experimenting with things like overtones with two notes at once. He does lovely old ballads that were introduced in movies of the 1930s. So he's got a breadth of repertory. He's got tremendous, you know, virtuosity as a musician and constantly a freshness of ideas and tremendous passion. Coltrane's prestige music has a, a lot of depth, a lot of passion, and a lot of intensity. And if you just listen to those records and forget that it's Coltrane and think about all the other saxophone players of the 1950s, you'll say to yourself, wow, this cat is definitely happening. He's definitely one of the hot saxophone players of the 1950s. People usually like to write about the prestige years as being something that led him to, you know, his great music of the 60s or whatever. But I think it's also important to remember he was no baby when he made those prestige recordings. He was already 29, 30 years old when he started recording there. And he had plenty to say at that time in his life. You know, uh, I mean, sure, everything leads somewhere, but everything's also what it is. Yeah, and what it is today is that, uh, or who it is today, is my guest, Louis Porter. Louis is a, a pianist, as you've uh, just heard, and uh, a jazz scholar. And he's written a number of books, including my favorite Coltrane book, highly, highly recommended. And uh, so let's say to your friend and mine, Louis Porter. Hey, Louis. Hi, Brett. Great to see you. Good to looks see like, you, my friend. Looks like you're out there with the beautiful sunset, having the time of your life. Well, it's a little hot, but, you know, such is the nature of uh, life in the desert. Louis, uh, where did it all begin for you? When, when did you first get interested in jazz and music? Well, it's funny. My older brother is not a musician, but he's a huge became a huge classical music fan at a young age and uh, used to bring home classical music LPs and I went crazy. I just loved Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, you name it. And I had decided by the age of 10 that I was going to devote my life to music. Only one problem, I didn't play an instrument, but that wasn't in my mind, that wasn't going to stop me. <laughs> So very shortly, my mom gave me, got me a violin teacher, and then uh, by the time I was 12, I was fooling around on a little upright piano that we had at home. And uh, by around that age, when I started to play the piano, there was a TV show called Peter Gunn that you may remember. Music by Henry Mancini. But the thing is, the, the show has, you can still catch episodes online, it had jazz playing almost continually through the entire show, except for commercials. So let's say the show was, without commercials, it was 25, 24 minutes. There was jazz playing the whole time. Uh, I know now that the people who were playing on it were people like Ray Brown, Shelly Mann, Art Pepper. All I knew was it sounded great. So then from the age of 10, I knew I wanted to be a musician. From about the age of 13, I said, okay, now I decided I want to be a jazz musician. And the piano was the instrument we had at home, so I, I gravitated toward it. And uh, did you do any formal studying? Well, that's the funny thing. I have a PhD in music, so people say you can't exactly say you're self-taught. But as a performer, to this day, I've had a sum total of about maybe three years of piano lessons spread out over my adult life. But I made very judicious use of those lessons. I would find out who the guru teacher was. For example, here in New York, the late Sophia Rosoff. I said, hmm, that sounds like somebody whose brain I should pick. And I found out what the good books are and talked to a million people. Somehow or other, it's worked out. I'm not saying 
It's not a system I would recommend, but it worked out. And I also played sax for a long time with very little training as well, and uh, even did some two sax concerts with George Garzon, who told me he liked the way I played the sax. So I guess I was doing something right, but the piano was always my main instrument. Now, Lewis, you've worked as an educator. You taught at Rutgers for a number of years. You're also going to be offering some online classes. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you have a real expertise, not only about John Coltrane, but also about Miles Davis, uh, Thelonious Monk, and Lester Young. How did you gain that expertise? Well, I don't know. I guess uh, I have a kind of methodical mind. If I got excited about something, I dug deep into it. So when I first heard of those people, I heard Monk early on. And I just, uh, the one I heard, I can tell you, was uh, Monk in France, which has also been issued under the name Two Hours with Monk. And I, it's from a 1961 tour. And he plays amazingly on that, very inventive. And uh, swinging like mad, of course. And, but when I get interested in something, I, I went nuts. I wanted to find out all of that person's work. So, for example, when I got interested in Lester Young, which was a few years later in college, um, I decided I wanted to hear everything by Lester Young. And in those days, it wasn't as easy as it is today. I had to get lists and look through magazines. And uh, I had to order, I remember ordering LPs from Europe because they had tracks that weren't available anywhere in the United States. But uh, I just got, when I got into something, I really got into it. And Train was actually one of the last. It wasn't until I was... 20, about 27, that I, uh, up to then I always liked Coltrane, but all of a sudden I really got a Love Supreme. It really spoke to me. And that's when I said, wow, I'm, I'm going to write something about Train. Yeah, one of our, our viewers uh, says he first knew of you from uh, your monography on Lester Young. How did wow. you get into Prez? I'm glad somebody remembers that because, uh, Trez was an unbelievable artist who influenced Train, who influenced Sonny Rollins, who influenced Bird, you know. Super important. Sometimes I like to say of the most important people in jazz history, Trez is probably the one that people know his music the least. And it's marvelous music. And actually, I have to give credit to the late John S. Wilson. Remember seeing his name in the New York Times and High Fidelity magazine and all this? And towards the end of his life, he was known as a curmudgeon. But earlier on, around 66, he had a list of recommended jazz albums. There were 50 of them, as I recall, in the New York Times. Now, get this. In 66, he not only recommended Louis Armstrong Hot Five and Lester Young with Basie, but on the same list, he recommended Albert Eiler Bells, which was a fairly recent release, and A Love Supreme, which was a recent release. So... At that time, he was super open-minded, and I followed his lead. I bought everything eventually on that list, which gave me a wide listening knowledge. But the Prez, I went crazy about it. I started transcribing those Prez solos and figuring them out on the piano. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of musicians are hip to Prez, but we find younger musicians, young people in particular, really don't know. So for those who, who don't know Prez, uh, I'll say this, that, you know, there was the Coleman Hawkins school and there was the Lester Young school. What okay. distinguished Prez's playing and made it so unique? He's so lyrical. There's a kind of a beauty and a lyricism in his playing and a very clear phrasing. Hawkins was brilliant. I was familiar with Hawkins before I ever heard Prez because uh, b going by this list of records, you know, he just happened to buy that sooner. And uh, he was a brilliant man and super respected. But I thought Dexter Gordon said it very well. He said, we all admired Hawkins and considered him the master of the horn. But as soon as we heard Prez, it hit us right in the gut and spoke to us on an emotional level. And there is really truth to that. You know, I I'm curious about your thoughts about this. Miles Davis... Uh, perhaps didn't possess the incredible technique that would allow him to keep up with Bird in the way Bird played. So he went the route of Lester Young, fewer notes. Do you agree with that? Uh, I think it's a very good perception, and I'll tell you a story to back it up. After that, uh, by the way, the first book came out because at the time that I studied with my mentor, 
Dr. T.J. Anderson at Tufts University. I was living in Boston. I'd happened, that's when I was transcribing the Prez solos, and he saw, I showed them to him. He saw, actually saw that I had them, and he said, what's that? I said, I've been transcribing in pencil some of these letters. He said, that can be your master's thesis. You'll study with me. By the way, I still love him. He's my mentor, and he's going to be 92 on the 16th, that's Sunday. And um, uh, so that eventually, actually, I wasn't even looking to publish. The word got out, and a publisher contacted me. And i um, trying to remember where I was going with, <laughs> with this now. Um, what, did, what did you ask me again? Pre about, about Miles mimicking oh, yeah. Prez's style. So get this. The publisher contacted me. It came out as a book. I got a call from Jackie McLean. Oh, Mr. McLean, what can I do for you? He said, man, I wish you had talked to me because I wanted to tell you that when I worked with Miles in the early 50s, he said that he was inspired by Prez. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. And certainly uh, uh, you hear Prez in his music. Um, before we go on to some other cats, I wanted to ask you how you feel, especially for young musicians. Is it good to transcribe solos? Does it really teach? Okay. Uh, as someone who, who teaches, my personal philosophy is you should certainly study solos. And Lenny Tristano is right that it's great to be able to sing complete solos. But as far as learning to play, I'm a big one for efficient practice. And for efficient practice, learning a whole solo is interesting and it's fun, but it's not going to have any usefulness for you. You're never going to play the whole solo in the middle of your solo unless you're some kind of a trickster, I guess you might. I did hear Dexter Gordon once played the first 16 bars of a press solo in the middle of his solo. So you can throw it in just as a kind of a, uh, a way to see if people are paying attention. But I feel that uh, efficiency-wise, it makes more sense to find the phrases you love and work on those. So, for example, once I heard Sonny Rollins go... And I said, wow, I love that. And I, I didn't need to know the rest of the solo from Pentop House. Just that phrase, I said, I'm, I'm going to use that. Yeah, well, Sonny, Roll Sonny Rollins and uh, Dexter Gordon love to quote, not only from <laughs> solos, but from uh, their repertoire. You know, Sonny Rollins, when he was a kid, he grew up listening to the Great American Songbook. He went to the movies every Saturday, he heard the, the material there, and he heard it on the radio. And that had a profound influence on his on his musical life. And Sonny and Dexter are perhaps the most famous quoters in our music. We hear a lot of a lot of things they just pull in, which is really kind of amazing when you think about it. It is. A friend of mine, Kryn Gabbard, wrote an article about quoters and he said this is something people don't think about it enough. You know, they, they don't realize how kind of a it's kind of a sleight of hand thing. And uh, uh, another thing, too, is that Sonny really loves those old songs. And I think it's a little bit of a misconception. People say, oh, he's making fun of the old songs. Uh, truth is, he loves them. There's a kind of nostalgic, romantic air to them that he kind of takes advantage of. Absolutely. So let's go, let's go to Mr. Coltrane. Your Coltrane book is meticulously researched. I mean, how long did it take you to write that book? Well, it's interesting you say that because in the endorsements by Robbie Coltrane and a lot of people, there's an endorsement by Dan Morgenstern and one by Jimmy Heath, and they both use the word meticulous. And I had to laugh. I said they should have, maybe the editor should have said, let's pick a different word so we don't overdo it. But I am, I'm nuts. Right now I'm working on the second half of a blog post for WBGO org about a love supreme and i i'm digging so deep into it that just yesterday i came up with some information that's never been published before and so i'm kind of delaying it to get all that in there and um what kind I, of information um all right i'll i'll give you a hint i'll give you a hint give it'll us a be, sneak preview it'll be up in a few weeks i already put up part one and i have some inf information about the overdubbing in the second part, there'll be a lot more information about overdubbing, which people don't think Train would have done, but he did. And 
the possibility that there are some other pieces where Coltrane is reading poetry on his saxophone without actually saying the words. So uh, people will be very, very interested in that, I think. And as far as how long it took me, uh, it could have taken forever, but I will say this, that I started working on it in 78, and the book came out in 98. So, but, uh, you know, I wasn't working on it nine to five every day, you know. So it was on and off. In the meantime, I published three other books, including two on Prez, but the, the long and short is on and off. 20 years, which is a lot of time. And as a lifetime listener of John Coltrane, when you started to work on the book, what surprised you? What did you find out that you didn't know? What actually, what got me to work on it was a surprise. And when I said I got into train a little later, there was a specific moment. I had heard of Love Supreme. I had the album. It was on the list of albums everybody should have, even as early as 66. And uh, I said, wow, this is terrific. This is excellent. And then in 78, I was listening, and I said, and when it got to the psalm, the fourth movement, I said, wait a second. I had it open, and there's a poem written in the line notes. I said, he's reading this poem syllable by syllable, but on the sax, not saying the words. That blew my mind, and that's when I said, I have <laughs> to write about this cat. In the meantime, I learned the hard way, because I was just going to write about the music and the publisher said, well, you have to have something about his life. And I learned the hard way. There was nothing that you could get, glean from what had been written about his life. They were incomplete. They, they uh, contradicted each other. There were things that just didn't make logical sense. So I started from scratch, and I found out a lot of interesting stuff about his family history uh, and about things that happened during his own lifetime, including his Navy file, which is public record, I managed to get a peek at that, and the fact that he has uh, a daughter in New Jersey named Sheila Coltrane that's been totally forgotten. Nobody uh, even wants to know she exists, but she's mentioned in my book. So she was uh, a daughter from another woman, or was she was from Naima? Well, let's just say that couldn't have been a uh, had to be a sticking point because it was from another woman while he was married to Naima, but the family knew about it. Naima knew about it, and his late cousin Mary knew about it too. Well, D Dizzy Gillespie also had a, a daughter who was, you know, wasn't revealed until uh, later in his life. Certainly, exactly. Lewis, could you could you play some Coltrane music for us? You know what I love to play is uh, Central Park West. In fact, Central Park West, I've recorded it a few times, most recently on my solo piano album. And um, I just love playing it. I think, I think it's gorgeous. And I always say, if he could write a tune like this about Central Park West, he sure must have loved living near Central Park. You know, I'll give you maybe a short version. Medium-sized version. Oh, uh, Let's do medium. Now, I'm going to take out my earbuds just for okay. comfort's sake. Okay. Is the sound coming through the earbuds okay? Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, Lewis Porter playing John Coltrane's Central Park West. I gotta fix my shirt here for a second. So when he wrote this, Lewis, did he live near Central Park West? He actually did. Um, I have the address somewhere. It might even be in my book, but it's something like 99th Street in Central Park West. Now, my wife and I live 92 and Columbus, which is about 10 blocks from there. So close enough that I can get into the vibe of that beautiful, beautiful tune, you know. The, this big book, I put together a team. They were working individually, and I said, you know, you guys should be get together because one was doing a huge discography, every recording session he ever made, but also all the private tapes. And you can say that this was prescient because a number of the private tapes that were listed here have since come out, like the Both Directions session that came out a couple of years ago and, um, and the Blue World uh, session. And uh, the other guy was working on a chronology, trying to list every gig that Coltrane ever did, and even having photographs of the album ads and the reviews in the newspapers. And some of them have little interviews with Coltrane. Hey, what are you going to be playing tonight? Stuff like that. So a lot of people call this kind of book a day-by-day book. It's, It's one of those things where you can check for each day that we have something, was he recording, was he performing, or both? People out there who want that kind of day-by-day uh, uh, look at Coltrane to study him. Now, um, exactly. hold on one second here. My background's a little mixed up. Okay, that's better. Now, <clears throat> undoubtedly, a major Coltrane influence uh, at a particularly important period in his development was Thelonious Monk. You said what, was you, what was your introduction to Thelonious? Um, this is a funny story. Uh, New Yorkers know about Sam Goodies. It used to be a record shop around, uh, it was 49th off of Broadway called Sam Goodies Record Shop. But what they might not know, you had to be a pretty serious collector to know, their policy was to have at least one of every LP in print. And they had them like a library by number along the wall. So I, uh, and oh yeah, and a couple of times a year they had half price record sales. My mom was a single mom, so half price is the only way I ever bought anything. And one day I went in there and they saw me. They said, hey, this, this kid, I was uh, probably about 14. They said, this kid is serious about jazz. They used to come up to me and say, what are you looking for, a kid? You know, And uh, they had a couple of jazz specialists. And uh, one of them came up to me once, do you have any Thelonious Monk? I said, no, why? He said, oh, you've got to have some Monk. And he just pulled out the one I mentioned, Monk in France, 1961. And I loved it. And I said, wow, I'm getting more Monk. That's it. You talk about New York record stores. I don't know if it was King Carroll or Sam Goody, but it was near Grand Central Station. There was a, an English guy named Jeff there who was like the jazz guy. Do you remember that? He was kind of tall and thin. I do remember him, and I, I feel like he was at both stores at one time or another. King Carroll was different because they had the old-fashioned thing where they had a booth. You could say, uh, can I listen to it? They said, yeah, go in the booth. See if you like it before you buy it. And uh, I think he may have worked at both. Did you say he had a little bit of a British accent? Yeah, he was, he was an Englishman originally. Yeah, yeah. I know his name was Jeff. That's yeah. all I know. He was a tall, thin guy. I definitely uh, dealt with him at Sam Goody's for sure. And I remember he, this wasn't the guy who said to get the monk, but this, I did see uh, this guy, Jeff, there a number of times and asked him questions. Yeah, well, that was back in the era of the record store. Yeah. What are your feelings about how music has changed in terms of people buy everything online now? You can't go to a record store. You can't listen to it first. You can't go in a booth. Well, as you know, there's there's pluses and minuses to everything. The availability is unbelievable compared to that. I mean, yes, Sam Goody's had one of every album in print, but unless you lived in New York, there were stores like that were, who knew if there were maybe two other stores like that in the whole United States that had every album. And so that was a great thing. Uh, but now you can find everything online, but... You don't have that guy standing there to say, hey, you know what? You're interested in jazz. You should have some Thelonious Monk in your collection. You should have this. It was almost like 
Today, it's the concept of the personal shopper. And that's what you don't have in music. You have kind of random listening. And I know people who are pretty, already pretty sophisticated musicians who haven't heard a lot of basic stuff and don't even know about it because their entire listening experience is more or less free association, random. It hasn't been methodical like mine was. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, we're products of, di of a different era. Re <clears throat> Excuse me. The importance of jazz radio was also major then. We got turned down to a lot of music just by hearing it on the radio. And also, when they played the music, they would identify the personnel uh, and they would talk about uh, the, the compositions, whatever. Radio now is they just basic. First of all, there's very few terrestrial jazz stations left. That's it's either true. satellite or on the web. And they just play the music. They really don't talk about it. I got to tell you, one of the things that got me into jazz initially was Billy Taylor. I used oh, to listen to funny? his shows you and on WNEW every Saturday. He pulled me in. You and me both. And in uh, where did you grow up? I forget. West Hartford, Connecticut. In West Hartford, because in New York area, he was on Monday through Friday on WLIB. And it started right after school. I think it was 4 p.m. And I used to listen to that religiously. And I learned so much. In fact, you, I could show you this sometime. I still have my notes from 1966 when he would say, he would play an album. I said, oh, wow, this is a great one. I'm going to make a note of this. And I still remember he played one that I went crazy about. And at the end, he, he listed the personnel. And he said, and that was Joe Henderson on sax. The album, it was a Duke Pearson album on Blue Note called Wahoo. And I said, I've got to get that. And I did. And I still feel that's one of my favorite Joe Henderson solos. Yeah, <clears throat> Billy was a remarkable man. I, I got a chance to work with him and uh, great you know, musician, great uh, communicator, educator. But let's go back to Thelonious. You got Thelonious to work has with a him very, closely. And he was, a, he was just that? a kind of a professional acquaintance of mine, but even I found him to be a lovely man and, and like you say, remarkable. But go ahead about our friend Mr. Thelonious, yeah. who really knew. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> Billy uh, <clears throat> was a protege of Art Tatum, I mean, we'll go, that's, that's the subject of another show. But exactly. Thelonious, let's talk about the piano of Thelonious Monk. Very, very idiosyncratic style. No one plays like Thelonious. For the uninitiated, how would you describe Thelonious' piano style? Well, it's interesting. I, I do a, a demonstration thing sometimes. I'll just do a little of it now. but. Uh, the, the funny thing, my late friend Don Friedman, the pianist, I was trying to figure out something that Monk did. And it sounded like, you know, <laughs> like he had like 10 notes. And Don said, no, no, listen again. He said, the funny thing about Monk is he plays less than you think, but makes it sound like all this is going on. And sure enough, he was just doing something like this, which isn't a lot of, a lot of notes, but it has a very strong sound. So one thing is the power of Monk sound. The other is that he swings like crazy and uh, the and he leaves a lot of space. So where other piano players like might go, uh, uh, they might be playing up here and go. He might go, uh, let's see, something like. And it's, it's more bare bones and yet very stark at the same time. And so in a funny kind of way, Monk has had a very interesting influence that even though he's, his sound is unique, he had an impact on a lot of people as disparate as uh, Muhal Richard Abrams, Horace Tapp Scott, but also Chick Corea and McCoy constantly said Monk was a huge influence on him. And these are all people that don't sound like Monk. Well, let's talk about his uh, influence on Train. Train played with Miles. He took a sabbatical and he played with Monk. Then we went back with Miles. How do you think Monk influenced Coltrane? It's funny because Train was a very honest guy. In interviews, he always told the truth, even if it was maybe not <laughs> the best idea. And uh, if you read between the lines, it's very clear that he had a feeling for Monk that he did not have for Miles. Even Miles in his autobiography says something like, Train and I never hung out. Well, Train says it a little differently. He says, with Miles, you never knew when he was going to get mad at you. 
that doesn't sound like a great relationship. But then he says, Monk, I loved playing with Monk. I loved hanging out with him and just thinking about music all day long. But the other thing about Monk was that playing with him, uh, because of his approach to the piano, I mean, uh, Miles had great piano players. He had Red Garland, and then later on, when Coltrane came back to the Miles band, he had Bill Evans, great players, but they're players that play a lot of notes. And uh, whereas Monk would just go... And then maybe leave a space. And uh, Train said there was something about the setting that Monk provided that real and the tunes, which were such challenging tunes, that it really made him play and challenged him to play his best. But it was also luck. Just before Train joined Monk, uh, what happened is he got fired by Miles. He did not leave Miles by choice. And, and that was his big break. It was a shock to him. He said, you know what? I'm getting my life together. He got off of heroin. Uh, took him a little longer, but eventually he stopped drinking. So it was partly luck that when he got to Monk, he had had a shock that made him get his act together, and he was physically, he said himself, feeling the best he'd ever felt. Well, why don't you play one of Monk's compositions for us? I happen to love a tune by Monk called I Mean You, and it's so cute because he puts the name in the tune. He goes, I mean you. I mean you, it's in the tune. And uh, so I'll play this. Uh, uh, short, medium? Medium. We're going to do medium. We go for medium, folks. All right. I mean you by Thelonious Monk. Thank you. 
Yeah, real nice. I mean you. Thelonious Monk composition played by Lewis Porter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, as we segue into Miles Davis here, I just thought of an incident, a recording session. <coughs> I think it was Christmas Eve 1956 uh, at Rudy's, Rudy Van Gelder's house before he built the studio in Hackensack. And it was, uh, I don't know if it was, I can't remember if it was Miles recording or a Monk recording, but Miles did not want Monk to play. Do you remember that story, Lewis? Yeah, the, the Christmas Eve of 54. And it's kind of a, a funny story because when they asked, it got blown up, I guess what I'm saying. Because uh, the truth is, Monk is such a strong personality that it is a very certain thing. If he's playing behind you, you're going to hear... A very strong sound and what Miles said is for his style that was hard for him to play with so he did ask Monk to what we call lay out don't play behind him and I, I actually according to both parties Monk and Miles it wasn't as uh, so much a blow up but it was something that People hadn't asked Monk before, you know, they said, you're Monk, that's how you play, fine, you know. But for Miles, it was tough to play with him, and, and I, as I think of it, I don't think there is another occasion where they played together. No, no, I don't think so either. Uh, now, regarding Miles, I wanted to talk to you about, there are several compositions that uh, were credited to Miles. There's some question about uh, if he really wrote, for example, Nardis. Uh, he's received credit, but supposedly Bill Evans wrote it. Walken, uh, well, actually, uh, Miles didn't receive credit. Uh, Richard Carpenter did. Miles played it, but it was really written by Gene Ammons. And mm. then Solar, uh, which is credited to, to Miles. What is this thing about Miles and taking credit for compositions that he did not write? Okay, so uh, once again, I, I have all this, you know, secret information. Uh, we already talked a little bit before about Coltrane information and about uh, some other things. And a lot of this, uh, I haven't published everything. I've published a lot about Prez, a lot about Coltrane, obviously. And I have two books on jazz history, and I worked with my our good friend Dave Liebman on his autobiography. But I've done tons of research on people like Miles, and that's what I'm going to be presenting in my six lectures on Miles every Friday starting October 11th. And that's at the uh, J Suite Music Academy. It's online. It's, it's online, open to anybody in the world. And uh, I'm going to have one class on Monk, which I'm, where I'm going to present some new information. That's coming out of, believe it or not, Lexington, Massachusetts, Adult Education. I'm going to do a class on Charlie Parker in October from the Berkeley College of Music. These are all online for everybody in the world can listen to them. Uh, but a lot of it's new information, so I'm going to uh, put it to you this way. Uh, yes, there are tunes credited to Miles that were not written by Miles. That are, that can, it can be proven that they're not written by, uh, by Miles. Isn't it possible, and I'm going to be presenting my evidence, that it wasn't Miles who claimed them, but the record company. And that would totally change everybody's point of view. And I'm going to show my evidence, and I think they may say, hey, maybe the cat was not such a thief as we think he was, number one. Number two, even the names, there is some question. So this is a funny thing. When we talk about Solar, first of all, uh, I ran into a person who's not a jazz person, and he said, what do you mean Solar? I said, solar, it's a tune. He said, no, that's not how the word is pronounced. The word is pronounced solar, solar energy, not solar energy. And I realized that we jazz people are so in our own heads, we don't even think of that. It's not solar, it's really solar, but it's hard to get. Now we're so used to saying solar, number one. Number two, the tune is by Chuck Wayne. That's been documented now because it turns out Chuck, a guitar player, that another one that my late friend Don Friedman knew and played with, he used to play this tune, and he has a demo that he made in the 40s, way before Miles ever recorded it. But his name for it was Sonny, S-O-N-N-Y, 
because he wrote it to play with his friend from the Woody Herman band, where they both were members, a trumpeter who went by the name Sonny Berman. Okay, so how do you get from Sonny to Solo? Get this, the tune is a kind of a very abstract uh, variation on how high the moon. Uh, Sonny could be interpreted as sunny, like the sun in the sky, so you've got the sun and the moon, and somehow from there you get solar. But what if not only it was the record company that credited to Miles, because he was under contract to them, not Chuck Wayne, it was an advant advantageous for them to get the royalties on the composition, which they would not get. Not only would they not get it if it said Chuck Wayne, they'd have to pay Chuck Wayne. Okay. But number two, what if the title is not by Miles? Because I found out by interviewing the late Ira Gittler that whenever they had an untitled uh, piece, which was frequent, he's the one who came up with the titles, and he was a legendary and very clever punster. So that title very likely is a Gittler thing. Well, I have all my proof, which I'll give to people when they take the course. Well, do you think you could play the tune for us? I certainly can, and I'll... Do it with my play along. I use the one that most play. The, it's uh, there used to be. Uh, there still is one called Band in the Box. I use the one called I Real Pro that most people like today. Here we go. <laughs> You've written two jazz history books. Could you tell us about those? I have, actually. By the way, I want to mention, uh, uh, sorry, I was fumbling a little to get the earbuds out of my ears and to, <laughs> to get to the play. And the other thing is I like to change the chords around on solo, so I, I do a few, for the musicians, I do some superimpositions there. And uh, I have one book that has an orange cover with Prentice Hall Publishers, and that's an overall history of jazz that I co-authored with uh, Michael Ullman, who's uh, a well-known Boston area jazz critic. Actually, both Boston. This is when I was, and uh, the chapter on the avant-garde in particular is written by Ed Hazel, 
Uh, so that book has a lot, has music examples. It's for the sophisticated listener, but it is introductory. And the other is a book called Jazz, A Century of Change, which is a collection of rare articles from all along the history of jazz divided up into topics. And in fact, I've had people who are well-known jazz historians who said to me, wow, this, this is not stuff that I've read before because I dug it all up from black newspapers and sources that had never been reproduced before yeah well it was certainly uh your knowledge of the music your love of it uh in your books and your teaching is something that uh, we really treasure lewis could you give people uh, first of all we've got your uh, website address on the on the page here and on the screen when you talk talk a little bit more about your online courses and how people can participate what does it cost all that stuff so uh, the easiest way is go to my Facebook, find me on Facebook, or just go to my website, lewisporter.com. And uh, in the next day or so, I'm going to be put up, putting up all the links. And uh, all the courses are online. All of them are open to anybody anywhere in the world. We're, I'm purposely doing them in the afternoon because that, that way it's early evening for people in Europe. And it's not too early for people on the West Coast. So it will be six classes on miles and I'm, they're chronological so if you don't know anything about miles you'll you'll get an overview but if you do know something you'll have some surprises like the information i just gave you that i think would surprise a lot of people about solar and uh one class about monk there will be one class about bird coming up later in the fall will be a series of classes about coaching and by the way i just recently did a presentation online about louis armstrong uh, because, uh, Brett, I'm not, I really am an overall jazz historian. I'm not only a modern jazz specialist, but I have research on Louis that uh, never, well, I shouldn't say was never published until I published it. Uh, and uh, research on King Oliver, you name it, I've, I've got all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, closing out here, we just got a few minutes. Uh, you, you did... Uh, a book with our good friend David Liebman. How did that happen? And can you tell us something about that book? Uh, Dave actually said to me, he said, there's something I want to talk to you about. And he was in New York. So we got together near the Manhattan School of Music where he was teaching. I said, I said, so how are you doing? I, I thought he just wanted to hang out. But he said, I really want to write my memoir. I really don't feel I can do it by myself. And I feel like you're the only person that I would trust to do it with me, which was very nice. We, we are friends. We get along great. So I eventually agreed to do it. And I said, well, let's do it this way. Let's do interviews. And then I'll, I'll have someone transcribe the interviews and I'll assemble it into a book. And uh, we did 25 hours of interviews. The book is close to 400 pages and it's got a level of detail about his time with Miles, about his time with El Elvin, about his early years and his training and his life and his family and uh, his wife, Karis, who's an oboist, and his daughter, who we know now is a publicist, you know, uh, Lydia Lieben. And uh, so and also his thoughts about other artists. And he's very candid. If you, you know, Dave, and for people who don't, he's very candid. If he doesn't like someone, he says so. And I even said to him at one point, Are you sure I shouldn't cut this out of the book? And he said, no, no, I already told him this to his face. So I, I think it's a great read, and I really think more people should uh, pick it up. Yeah, I think uh, I've known Dave for about 20 years now, and I think you've captured Dave in a way that no one else has. And I highly recommend the book. Dave was our guest uh, on the show here a couple of weeks ago, and I've started to post uh, some of the interview and pieces and Dave is a remarkable communicator, and he's a straight shooter. No bullshit from Dave Liebman, let me tell you. You got so, it. So we burned through an hour here. Any closing words, Lewis? I'm looking forward to seeing uh, some, some of the people who are listening and watching now. I'm looking forward for, uh, to seeing them at some of these courses that I'll be teaching. Uh, I hope people check out some of my albums, like the one with my friend Terry Lynn Carrington and John Petitucci, Tia Fuller, and uh, anybody who has questions about anything or wants to know what I'm doing, just go to lewisporter.com. Uh, all my contact info is right there. All right. 
Thank you, Lewis Porter, for joining us. Next week, our guests will be Mike Abeni, oh, the great good. jazz arranger, and Don Lukoff, who's Beautiful. a distinguished jazz publicist. Absolutely. So we're going to go out here with uh, a little humor. So everyone stay safe, have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. We're not going to let Joe Biden and Kamala Harris cut America's meat.